In 10 years, where will Nintendo be? The richest gaming company in the world, or back at the bottom living with the scraps of the GameCube and Wii U? Where will they be in 20 years? In 30. This next console is the turning point for the company, and the Switch itself will prove to be the end of an era. The Nintendo Switch has lived a fantastic life, beating nearly all of Nintendo's records, but it's not perfect. It's weak, it's got broken controllers, and frankly, it smells bad. But even then, all things considered, this is one of Nintendo's greatest consoles. One of, because Nintendo has a string of consoles so perfect, I'd even consider them to be the Nintendo Renaissance. However, every Renaissance has a Dark Ages preceding it, and Nintendo had two. Starting with the N64, a great console, but with a punch instinct to it. Compared to the Sega Saturn and the PlayStation's 32-bit hardware, the N64 released with, as you can probably guess, 64 bits. What's a bit? No one truly knows. But this meant that N64 was far more powerful. Quite a bit more powerful. It had faster load times, more polygons, more RAM, more ports for multiplayer. But the N64 was still the start of the first Dark Ages of Nintendo. You see, while it had better hardware, it also used the dreaded cartridges. They allowed for faster load times and a stronger defense against piracy, but at the cost of far less storage and being more expensive to produce. This frankly killed the N64. Without the far cheaper CDs of the PlayStation, developers were hesitant to develop on it. And even when they did, they didn't have nearly as much room for the higher quality textures and sound files of the PlayStation. By no means was the N64 a bad console with its ingenious, albeit goofy analog stick, and incredible couch multiplayer. However, it definitely pointed Nintendo towards the true Dark Ages. And as much as it pains me to say so, the first Dark Ages climaxed with the GameCube. Perhaps you're in your own Dark Ages. In that case, Southern New Hampshire University is here to bring you the education your future needs, because with their degree in game development, you can learn everything you might need to make your dream games and get paid while doing it. Because at SNHU, they'll teach you the three pillars of programming with C Sharp, C++, and Java. So you can program your way out of any problem. And with the help of art and character design, you could make the craziest encounters of your nightmares into reality. And speaking of reality, don't mind the fact that you can become a master of your own worlds with game physics and user interface design. And if none of that sounds appealing, SNHU has dozens of degrees all available for you. And with my link in the description or by going to snhu.edu slash arctic, you can sign up to see all the information of your desired program, including how much you could get paid in the industry. So go ahead and visit snhu.edu slash arctic and jumpstart your future today. This will certainly be controversial to say, but the GameCube was a terrible console. Financially, I could never say that it wasn't fun or revolutionary, but it was bad. The PlayStation 2 sold 130 million units more than the GameCube, and even the newcomer Xbox sold a few million more. <laughs> Tears of the Kingdom is just a few thousand units away from surpassing it in under a year. Now that's definitely not as bad as the Wii U, we'll get there soon enough, but 20 million is a pretty rough number for the company that single-handedly saved video games. But uh, we still can't deny how great this console was for those who bought it anyways. Four player Smash with fighting mechanics that are still adored to this day, a brand new spin-off Mario game centered around Luigi capturing ghosts, the best soccer game ever in Super Mario Strikers, Donkey Kong Jungle Beat? Oh, and some of the best Zeldas ever, right next to the best Mario RPG ever. Yeah, this console was fantastic. For Nintendo fans. And if you didn't care about Mario or Zelda, all you really had was Resident Evil and kids shovelware. I don't really need to say why this console failed. Obviously, it was because of the smaller discs and Nintendo's continued obsession with annoying every third party available. It really sucks because the GameCube was far more powerful than the PS2, but this generation proved to Nintendo that perhaps power isn't as important as it was 10 years ago. So that must be why the Wii U was so garbage compared to everything else. And it's not like that even matters because this thing has Wii Sports and the Wiimote and Donkey Kong Jungle Beat now with new play control. 
There are two ways of seeing the Wii in the Dark Ages and Renaissance. In one sense, it continued Nintendo down a whole new type of Dark Ages, with casuals and underpowered hardware. However, Nintendo was finally back at the top. Not just with home consoles, but alongside the DS, Nintendo was propelled back into mainstream conscience. Finally, after failing console after failing console, they hit big. The Wii had its issues. Yeah, it had its issues. But it kept Nintendo from facing the same fate as Sega, at least for a few more years. The Renaissance can't always last forever, and when there's a Renaissance, at some point, the Italians are gonna start a war to end it. And for Nintendo, that war was the Wii U. Real shame I had to get drafted into that war. The Wii U was just like the GameCube in many aspects. Most of the world didn't want it, but those of us who did have it were eating good. Well, sorta. The Wii U was still worse off from the GameCube due to its functional yet pointless gimmick and frankly terrible hardware. On the GameCube, we got the best Smash Bros ever, a brand new franchise with Luigi's Mansion, and the best Donkey Kong platformer ever, fight me. While on the Wii U, we got the second best Smash Bros at the time mechanically, a brand new franchise with Splatoon, and the second best Donkey Kong, alongside a bunch of other games that nobody asked for, but certainly weren't bad. Games such as Super Mario 3D World, Captain Toad, and Yoshi's Woolly World. The Wii U had so much potential, but was doomed the moment Reggie first said its name on stage. The bubonic plague was spreading, and even Nintendo's previously unbeatable handhelds faltered a bit with the 3DS failing to even outsell the PSP from the last generation. It looked like Nintendo was finally going to die. My daughter. Anyways, Nintendo released the best open world game ever and will never die. So that's where we're at now. But didn't I say that Nintendo had a string of consoles so perfect they would be known as the Nintendo Renaissance? Well, it sounds like the only good console throughout all of that was the Wii. Well, not quite. The N64 and GameCube were terrible, frankly abhorrent for Nintendo financially. But as a Nintendo fan, can you name a better era for any of their franchises? Some of their best games of all time, even to this day, released on these two systems. And no, it's not just nostalgia. Sure, the graphics aren't PS5 ray traced, but nothing is. And the gameplay of these games like Ocarina of Time, Smash Melee, Wind Waker, Mario 64, FCR GX, Star Fox, and Donkey Kong Jungle Beat all hold up today. The list goes on, but the Nintendo Renaissance was truly with the N64 and GameCube. Nintendo wasn't afraid to experiment or go completely wild with their ideas and controllers because at this point, what did they have to lose? Now, the Wii and DS, I might argue, are the turning point for Nintendo into the Dark Ages because while there's still admiration for the fans, it started to give way as the casuals became Nintendo's main focus. The games got simplified. The games got more chaotic. The games got more... whatever this is. Not all of these changes were bad, but they weren't for the fans. They were for their pockets. Going into the Wii U and 3DS, it was the same. Games for the masses without any real substance. But as Nintendo realized they're a dying company again, they became the Nintendo we love. The Nintendo that makes Breath of the Wild. Now as they entered into the Switch, and as we're getting ready to leave it behind for something we hope is far better, the question is asked. Are we still in that renaissance, or just at the beginning of a new Dark Ages? The Switch was no doubt a treat for any Nintendo fan, and everyone else. Some of the best games in each of Nintendo's franchises are on the Switch, we had so many franchises born or resurrected back to their former glories. Not everything was a hit, like ARMS or literally every Mario sports game, but Paper Mario returned in two great ways that leaves most fans optimistic for the future, and even games like F-099 provide a glimmer of hope. But Nintendo has the chance to fall back into complacency again. Nintendo is more successful than ever, but perhaps that means they won't try as hard to satisfy everyone in the next generations. Maybe they'll focus too much on sheer power over sheer entertainment. We all want the next console to be like the GameCube. New franchises left and right, 
with incredible gameplay all around. But that shouldn't come at the cost of Nintendo going bankrupt. Every time Nintendo is in a financial dark ages, the fans get enlightened with the renaissance of Donkey Kong Jungle Beat. But this time, Nintendo needs to have a renaissance for both of us. Otherwise, the Switch will be the end of an era. The Switch is the end of Nintendo's roller coaster of success and failure. The Switch is the end of Nintendo being the laughing stock of gaming. The Switch is the start of the golden age of Nintendo. Otherwise, there won't be a Nintendo. But that's just what I'm smelling. So maybe all we need to do is give the Switch a bit of deodorant. And as always, keep cool. Bye.